Section 20 The hammer shattered what happened to the Imperial Guard? As mentioned before, the Imperium fell, and with it fell the Munitorum, the Navy, and countless other galactic organizations. They all tumbled into the void in the horror like everyone else. Administratum clerks continued their mindless tasks, filing reports and signing documents that no one would ever see besides them. As worlds were cut off from one another, communication was also cut, like a blade across a vox wire. Fleet dispositions and ship manifests were lost, misfiled, or sent to other accounting facilities, on other worlds, and lost forever in the sea of souls. Central authority took a sharp decline, until any hope of contacting superiors became pointless. Vast crusade fleets of soldiers and vessels gradually lost contact with any other authorities. Without logistical support from forge worlds and agri planets, crusades ground to a halt, or carried on regardless, their soldiers and troopers starving as the grueling crusades wore on. The foes grew more numerous, and the natives of planets more hostile. Some crusades, like the Nihilus Crusade, utterly collapsed, as the Imperial Guard and much of the naval staff began to mutiny across every ship in the fleet, rioting over food rationing, which had reached sickening levels. The Lord General, Admiral, and even the Chief Cardinal, were butchered, and the various ships of the Crusade fleet, each taken over by rival factions, fought with each other. In a violent and pointless naval battle, over the planet of Kyoto, the wreckage from this colossal battle raining upon the planet with fiery contrails of shattered ships. Often, crusades would find that the various imperial worlds they encountered did not recognize their authority, and would attempt to resist the landing and respelling of crusade ships. More often than not these crusade fleets would end up battering the worlds into submission, and taking what they needed, often sending the imperial guard forces down to conquer the planets personally. The enemies of the crusade thus became more and more, not only were heretics and xenos enemies, but also the various petty imperiums that the crusade fleet inevitably trespassed within, causing yet more wars. Crusades, who had precious few resources to begin with, swiftly ran low, and were often defeated, by M46. Most major imperial crusades, depleted and battered, were no longer effective, and fell apart. However, they were the lucky few. The majority of Imperial Crusades and forces were utterly scattered, as they tried to navigate the tumultuous war. Sometimes only single vessels emerged from the ether, their crews either mad or utterly broken. The countless thousands of Imperial Guard regiments were scattered across the entire Imperio, often shattered into brigades or single regiments. These few remaining Imperial Guard often numbered in the thousands or even, in some extreme cases, millions. Some were left stranded on previously conquered war zone. These men either tried to found colonies, hired themselves out as mercenaries for local tribal warfare, or were massacred by the human and non-human natives. Other, more fortunate dispossessed Imperial Guard units and squads had access to troop ships or had seized a naval vessel by force. In various states of disrepair, these Imperial Guard irregulars and rogues traveled through the galaxy, using short warp jumps to avoid too much danger to their decrepit vessels. Some, like the remnants of the 343rd Terex Guard, led by Colonel Hasterbeck, managed to find employment by joining one of the petty Imperiums they came across. In the case of the 343rd, it was the Aphelian Imperio. These guardsmen and professional soldiers were used as garrison forces for these post-Imperial settlements, and also were used to train and drill the new armies of the petty Imperiums. Instilling some measure of expertise and experience into these previously merely PDF groups. Some, like the Harakoni Warhawks and Elysian Drop Troops, refused to compromise their integrity, and remained in their own uniforms and maintained their own traditions. Nevertheless, in a hostile galaxy, even these elites were forced to join other local level power groups. It is claimed that somewhere within the Segmentum Pacificus a group of soldiers, from various different Imperial Guard regiments, have been gathering around an abandoned and ruined star fort, and are organizing a resistance. Against who, even they do not know, they raid various petty Imperiums, in the hope that one day, the real Imperium will come and relieve them. Unfortunately, they have no idea the real Imperium, no longer exists. Thus, they are little more than organized terrorists, waging a war against an imaginary enemy, and slaughtering citizens of countless petty Imperiums. Without realizing these very Imperiums are the Imperio, around the systems near to Armageddon, the Savla Chem Dogs, who were fighting on many worlds, managed to not only survive the misery of the loss of the Imperio, but in fact flourished and festered. 
as lice and other such vermin such as M have a special skill for. They formed an unofficial black market, dealing in vile narcotics and other illicit substances, cooperating with the equally devious and immoral ratlings. The Savlers had no real interest in defending the worlds of humanity. Instead, as worlds desperately fought off foes and became poverty-stricken and vulnerable, Savler drug cartels and protection rackets sprang up on underhive streets and slum zones across hundreds of worlds, muscling in onto other criminal businesses, using their military training to beat the competition in many cases. They were also notorious gun runners and arms dealers, selling weapons to both sides in wars, profiting from others' misery. Though Savler, their home world, was caught up in the terrible effects of the awful Omkiosos, the Savler chain dogs managed to continue on their horrid little lives. Of the worlds which spawned the various Imperial Guard regiments, they faced a problem. Many of the best Imperial Guard worlds, like Catelchen and Krieg, were focused around providing soldiers for the Imperio. With nowhere to export these soldiers, their populations grew enormously. Their soldiers needed to be utilized, and used to help keep their planets safe. Each took a different approach to this. The Governor General of Catelchen wisely formed a close alliance with Riza, in exchange for ships and weapons. Katachan gave Riza large numbers of quality fighters to supplement its skittery, who were few in numbers, comparatively. This alliance allowed them to secure a wide area, and defend it from all comers, even mighty Huron's Chaos Imperio. Krieg, as mentioned before, turned its soldiers into commodities, and exported them across the galaxy. Some guard worlds joined petty imperiums, and used their unused soldier tithe to boost the defenses of these post-imperial empire. In some rare cases, imperial guard home worlds had many empires of their own to begin with, before the second age of strife, such as Talon. Talon used its wealth and massive armies to expand their lands, and formed a petty imperium of their own. Of the Steel Legions their story links closely with the Ballad of Armageddon, and thus shall be explained there, not here. In the period of woe, this second age of strife, where war and domination is currency, the Imperial Guard, the second best fighting force in all the old Imperium, were incredibly valuable. Whoever had the most guns, had the power. Whoever had the power would survive. This was the depressing, torturous creed of the 51st millennium. Section 21 The Cyclic Apocalypse, The Black Ships, and The Next. The death of the Emperor was an illethal blow to existence itself, more so than any living being could fully comprehend. When the Emperor's heart was pierced by that most foolish of traitors, his soul, scattered and insane, burst apart, flinging itself into the swirling maelstrom. The warp washed into reality in a tidal flood, killing terror. Similarly, reality, to a certain extent, washed into the warp. The great edifice, the link to the webway forged by the Imperator, was smashed from its moorings in reality, and floundered in the madness sea. The living mesh that was the webway writhed and convulsed, as the strand of reality tumbled through the warp. We shall come to this later. The deepest depths of the warp were disturbed, and forces beyond reckoning or sanity, strove for the surface of their inverted emotions spherical realm. They burst the surface, turning inwards and shattering like glass, as they envied and giggled and felt emotions only the most incomprehensible of Zenus ever felt. A great blanketing numbness flooding inwards, spilling outwards as it pushed in parallel to the madness. Grim sanity spread like a glass plate, sliding over a churning mad sea. It was shattered in places, or melted, or any number of futile analogies. The Starfather was rousing, and the war migration exodus began in earnest. It would be utterly impossible to explain what was happening in the warp accurately, thus I must drift into colorful analogy to continue. Across all the realms of chaos, from the living rot forests of Nurgle to the churning brass forges of the Lord of Rage, a great silver wall, solid and blank, was grinding, pushing aside the demonic realms like a plow through snow. The crystal maze of seams was shattered and ground to dust, then reformed, and was shattered anew. The rings of Slanish's inferno were breached, as the faceless, blade-winged angles of the Starfather spread forth, one with the wall, yet apart from it. At last, Korn could take no more. A voice that could shatter continents resounded across the entire realm of chaos, plunging mountains into lava lakes, and pulverizing demon trees and devils spawn. It was a call to war, as he rose from the skull throne, black sword of destruction clutched in his vast talons. A billion billion demons arose with him, from bloodthirsters, to blood crushers, and other, indescribable horrors. Legions of demon princes, armored with demon mail and blades of lethal effect, marched under banners of slaughtered skin and bloodied flesh. Korn himself besieged the great silver wall, pounding it with every weapon and devil he could. 
the wall constantly shattered, yet merely split into innumerable grinding walls, which ensnared the blood god, who howled in frustration. The mindless Scarbrand dueled the dominion itself, Malkadarangil. Infinite energies flowed across the beings, as fire fought light, and bloody blade clashed with burnished nightmare steel. The walls continued, smashing aside even the formless waste, spearing through like a thunderbolt. Tsinch, using every trick and scheme and power, misdirected and deceived the walls, splitting them and dividing them, as he hastily made alliances and arc pacts with his brothers and sisters. Guided by the babbling predictions of the Fatshiva, Tsinch tricked and tracked the infinite enemy, and guided his enemy allies against this true threat. The great game took on a new face. Nurgle, advised by his brother, cast a bile-filled contagion, which tarnished the silver bastions, and allowed plague bearers and capering demonets to wriggle within the structure. Innumerable devils and monsters dueled the blank beings which glowed within, formless yet mighty and bleak. Nurgle, empowered by the despair of the losing battle, surged forth, resplendent and powerful. A morass of stinking flesh and foulness formed his bulk, and he sprouted rotten forests of decay in his slug-like wake, as he drew forth his cauldron, to personally pour its contents down the soul father's throat. He boiled the silver wall aside, as his corruptive influence plunged through, into the star realm. Like a billion universes, stars and tranquil evening skies filled the bastion in all directions, and Nurgle himself had to form a bridge of corruption, just across the expanse. And there, at the center of the spiral, stood the Starfather. A thousand miles tall, the Colossus glowed a blinding gold, and where his burning golden stare landed, corruption could not flourish, chaos became set, trillions of souls stood, utterly frozen under the gaze of the Starfather, unthinking, unfeeling. One by one, the great being plucked them up, and broke them. He had no face, just a titanic golden crown, which enclosed his head, and blazed with internal fire. Nurgle, undaunted, plowed forth, like a living tide of filth. The blades of the father smashed the demon thing to the ground, and Nurgle's corrupted blades just held back the merciless force of the Starfather. Then, something even the grandfather of disease couldn't predict, occurred. Upon pennions of flayed and stagnant flesh, the angel of despair, Isha herself, appeared. Wriggling free of her chains, the goddess wailed, howling in agony and misery, flickering tears of despair rattling against the order god's impregnable armor. Over the eternity of imprisonment, she was quite insane, and such was Nurgle's influence, that she was bound to him eternally, in a marriage of abomination. He, the Starfather, paused, his voice a deep rumble, as glacial ice over rock. A bay he bawled, swatting Isha aside. However, her intent was never to defeat him. Her freedom had attracted another being that lusted after her essence. Suddenly a dozen singing blades sank into the armor of the Starfather, as the Prince of Pleasure, she who thirsts, slithered upwards to engage the monster. The father wrestled the heinous goddess god, venom, fire and blades darting and twisting beneath and above the combat, as god faced god, Nurgle became a vast swamp, ensnaring the titanic legs of the starfather, with sucking, demonic mud, angels poured from the walls and roofs, at the sight of the starfather in distress, echoing him utterly, as they plunged into combat, demons wriggled from between the toes and talons of the battle in chaos gods, intercepting the glowing beings, engaging in epic conflict. The bastions advanced and retreated, as the other realms plunged over each other like tides on a beach, coming from all angles at once. The three gods wrestled, but the Starfather was the stronger, and he beat them back, his voice a thunderous gale, as he cursed and bellowed at the hated foes. Whispers and confusing illusions assailed the Starfather, and saved Slanesh and Nurgle, as Tsinch worked his illusions and magics upon the god of order. However, amazingly, the Starfather and his angels fought back all these endless foes. Their gold and silver light was as a torch to hay, as it burns and scorched the demons fiercely, flinging them backwards, filling their hearts with the dread of order. However, as they faltered, the final god ascended, smashing through the crystal roof of the bastions. Korn leapt into the Star Realm. His first strike struck the helm of the Starfather, dealing him a deathly blow, and staggering the confused god. The second flurry of blows were parried desperately by the flaming golden blade of the Starfather. The five gods exchanged and traded blows for eternities upon eternities, destroying realms, only to remake them with an instant. Demons and angels wailed and bitterly fought, as they were plunged into oblivion again and again. However, this war was one thing the Starfather could not control, it was chaotic. The chaos unleashed upon everything and everybody within the realm of the warp fought to the primordial annihilator strengths. 
chaos drove back order, and the order god was cast down. Yet, such was his power, he could not be banished as demons and spirits could be. He became a fixed, dreadful point in the ever mad seas of souls. Of course, this account above is merely an analogy, for the churning storm of abomination, which rippled throughout the warp, in all directions and chronologies, defies description and explanation. It snatched away the souls of almost all astropaths, dragging them into the bodies of angels, to fight the incomprehensible war. It made the deep warp an impenetrable bastion of utter lunacy, destroying any vessels traveling through those routes. Only the shallows of the warp were safe now. Of the black ships, many separate tragedies befell them. The black ships, vessels dedicated to rounding up sickers and transporting them to terror, were suddenly made obsolete, as the Astronomicon spluttered, over the course of years, until it was nothing. Then terror tumbled into hell, and madness took hold of the galaxy. The black ships, crammed with sickers, that were about to enter the warp, suddenly were forced to pull away, their navigators going mad instantly. These ships became become, trapped in the void, light years from anywhere. Trapped in reality, sickers, driven insane and empowered by the churning warp, fought at their restraints and cells. The grim dark halls of the sicker ships became battlegrounds, where cold-hearted stormtroopers and sororitas engaged the gibbering hordes of sicker horrors. Soon these black ships became tomb ships, as their defenders engaged their failsafe devices, pumping cyanide and urotoxins throughout the vessels, mutually destroying both imperial and monster equally. They were the lucky ones. Many of the black ships were trapped within the warp, as the guiding light faltered. Some were torn asunder instantly, others became utterly lost in the warp, their navigators lost or executed. Some, believing they had rediscovered the Astronomicon, headed towards an area of deep warp where a golden light seemed to become the warp. These vessels disappeared, frozen forever in mid-action. The infant star child had ensnared them forever. Others crashed into driving hulks fusing at the physical, and even spiritual, level. Their liberated cargo would then flee into the depths of the hulks, or else die, moaning silently, as their bodies fused painfully with the walls. The most infamous example of a black ship through the warp, was that of the Tursis. Its tail is long, and, in some places, incomprehensible. Nevertheless, I shall endeavor to narrate their tale. The Tursis captain, as the beacon of the Astronomicon vanished, ordered the ship to leave the warp immediately. The navigator tried his best, wrestling his ship through the unimaginable tides and fluctuations, as things beyond understanding clashed and rolled within the madness. He approached the shallows, to his horror, however, there was no reality beyond, and they plunged back into the madness. They were lost, lost forever. The navigator soon began to descend into madness, and was replaced by his assistant. He was killed by his mind, uh, with a bolt to the brain, battered by the tides and churning masses of maddening warp stuff, battering the Geller field, the Tursis dive, like a black dart they descended, upwards, into the surrounding deep warp. The engines bucked and hissed and crackled, smoke and mud as vapors filled the cabins of the ship, incensing and driving the sickers beyond sanity. They launched all their cyclic abilities against the cells and restraints, burning out their broken minds. The sisters on board, led by Sister Superior Medaline, fought like legends, slaughtering and murdering the flaming witches wherever they found them. Stormtroopers barricaded all then on cell chambers, barring the entrance of the mad warp terrors. The actual ship's crew managed to be protected from the worst of the horrors. Every human chanted litanies of protection, and prayers to the Emperor. The ship plummeted, faster and faster, and slower, as they ascended into the deepness of the most dark and unbound warp depths. The walls began to bleed, as gibbering things shoved their way into their reality bubble. Talons and tentacles, everywhere. Helgens glowed white hot, such was their rate of fire. Bolters barked and roared, blasting chunks of masonry and maggot-ridden flesh architecture, as power weapons and holy objects smashed apart devil-faced demons. And scuttled semi-humanoids and sicker monsters, all fire and misery, as they literally flew at their foes, blazing talons drawn. Yet, they endured, as they plunged into the deep warp even deeper, and ever outwards. Slug monsters emerge in the engine block, and the Margo aboard fought them with all his cold, logical might. Unfurling dozens of bladed mechanical appendages, the Margo flung himself at the slug wolf things, cackling binary nonsense as he howled mechanically. He hacked down countless hundreds of the things, but their blood just clung to the walls, and sprouted more devils, which surrounded and befouled him, dragging him down into their foul embrace. The Geller field failed, like a foul gale, 
The walls began to shatter and bleed, as they came apart at the instant of failure. Suddenly, they regained integrity, the ship reforming partially. The demons eased off, and were forced back, at great cost. Only then did the defenders gaze outside, the fallen edifice, the fragment of reality, tumbling, warded, down into the upper heights of the deep wall. They had crashed inside it, and light flooded the view screens, as they gazed across the strange realm, which loomed under and over them simultaneously. Though it crawled with runes, and was painful to even look upon, the crew realized it was, in fact, real. Some of the more desperate insane crew forced open access hatches, and crawled out into this mad wilderness, sobbing with hope and elation. The ground above them formed into multicolored horrors, and dragged them off, through the floor, into the wall. Hope was not a safe emotion to exude, evidently. The hatches were sealed soon after this. And so, riding upon a diseased fragment of reality, the black ship plunged. Monsters assailed the defenders at random, plunging into the ship with no effort. Back to back, the troopers and sisters fought, battering back the devilish foes. They fired their pistols, until spent. They hacked with blades, until blunt and broken. They battled with fists, until their limbs were broken and useless. Then they fought with their teeth, and their bodies. Desperately, the underlings of the Margo sought to repair the destroyed Geller field, as demons lapped mere inches from their workspace, held back only by the wild, savage strength of the desperate stormtroopers and sororitas. To the great surprise of several defending Imperials, the surviving Sickers, who still lived, fought back against the demons, driving them back with sorcerous chants, and searing warp blasts. One such patient, the former occupant of cell 1, pulverized demons and warp creatures, his vast psychic energies driving the monsters insane, and bursting their stolen bodies. It was said the Sicker even saved the life of Medaline, boiling the blood of a tusk demon in male armor, even as it reared over her prone form. Aided by their surviving Sicker quarry, the defenders forced back the beasts, as the Geller field shuddered, spluttering, into life once more. As they tumbled, the various defenders began to age. Some grew older, rapidly. Some stayed the same age, while others began to get more youthful. Others were slowly devoured by the walls, wailing weakly, as the possessed metal sucked them in like quicksand. They ate mutant and demon flesh, they drank stagnant blood and thick, sentient fluids. In the immaterial realm, the defenders became something less than human, something more than mortal. The miserable and monstrous occupants of the vessel began to copulate and fornicate, as the years wore on, their children were hoofed and twisted, bawling bundles of claws and malice. Yet still they tumbled, the ship fell past countless indefinable horrors, and wonders that would make us and weep. Eventually they entered the final depth, the full doom, record missing document descends into bizarre glyphs and runes, bursting into multi-hued flames, before forming a sea of spiders, and scuttling away, across the desk. Servitor guns forced to destroy record, record resumes. And they screamed next, not Catan and there was ice fire in their hearts. Yet, the ship, shorn of its reality raft, descended up and across, evading the lingering, and they screamed next, not Catan and there was ice fire in their hearts. Yet, the ship, shorn of its reality raft, descended up and across, evading the lingering tendrils of the neck. What happened in the realm cannot be explained, nor should it. The Sicker from Cell 1 purged the souls of dozens of his followers, boiling their souls, for fear that any trace of the necks remained within them. Yet, it seemed as though sanity began to reassert itself, gravity began to express itself upon their limbs. Air began to have a taste, not just an emotion. Once more, the walls were solid, for the most part. Each defender of the ship now had a single shape, unlike in the final depth. Eventually, with a burst of mind-shattering horror, the Tersis emerged, heralded by a storm of bile and colored lights. They emerged in 999 M42, roughly a hundred years since becoming ensnared in the immaterial. It was a darkly changed vessel now though, like a semi-living flesh shark, the possessed vessel drifted, a hellscape made flesh. Arm in arm, the corrupted Medaline and the Witch Lord of Cell 1, resided over a crew of twisted monsters, who worked the machineries of the vessel as if all was normal. Their minds shattered and splintered. This horrific ordeal was not unique to the Tursus. Vessels lost in the warp would frequently, throughout the second age of strife, emerge from the warp, transformed into colossal warp possessed beasts. Which would then fall upon unsuspecting mortal worlds, attacking furiously with fangs and warpish flame. These common occurrences would later be nicknamed Hellsubs, due to the submerged nature of the twisted wrecks. 
No matter the horrors the second age of strife would soon bring to the galaxy, it was nothing compared with the numbing abomination of the Deep War. 4. As the Mariners of Ancient Legend would warn, there be monsters. Section 22 The Blood and the Sword Blood Knights of Baal, and the legacy of Mephiston the Undying. The cataclysm left no planet, no person, unaffected from the eye, all the way to the very furthest fringes of the eastern expanses, the rampage of the new Devara claimed untold quadrillions of beings, ripping them asunder in orgies of bestial hunger, as if in mocking irony, the emperor toppled from his throne, slain or merely dying, it did not matter, for the result was the same besides, the doom of the imperator affected all who could perceive the great surging changes, resounding across the entirety of existence, the marines, as mentioned before, were, for the most part, utterly shattered, their remnants descending into barbarity, insanity, or simple defiance. The children of Baal, the Blood Angels, and like all other chapters, experienced all three of these outcomes. During the 41st millennium, it was claimed the Blood Angels were already on the road to division. Dark Whispers claimed that Angel fought Angel, through the staggering vaults of their fortress monastery. Successors were drawn to their ancestral homeworld. None can be sure what transpired, but the events bound the children of the blood together tightly. Their conflagration cost the lives of many of the marines and serfs, leaving the founding chapter broken down to an unprecedentedly low number. However, when the Astronomicon failed, flickering out like a firefly, the sons of Sanguinius, from several of the chapters, found themselves fortunately close together. Thus, when the vast inner crystal empire took their moment to strike an apparently weak imperial sector, Dante and the Blood Angels were ready. Their fleets, hopping from system to system using short warp jumps, managed to engage the fiends, who used their bodies as deadly prisms, amplifying and channeling light into tight beams of death. The combined force of crimson armored warriors descended upon the Xenos with great wrath and fury, in the system of Cassus. The crystalline vessels clashed with the Astartes battle barges, arcs of glimmering light and energy passing between them like crimson tapers. Hull ships were plunged into smoldering ruins, and colonies of Vastina shattered into blazing shards. Cassus I, the hive world the two forces battled over, watched in barely disguised auras shapes moved in the heavens, rumbling and lighting the skies, like battling gods of war, or turned to horror as arcs of energy fell amongst their spires and ecodome. The streets ran with scorching molten glass and searing plasma storms, as entire habs slid under the bombardment of hyper-powerful lances and invisible beams of murderous Vastana light beam. Misfires and the naval engagement above, Dante himself teleported aboard the lead Xenos vessel, his golden honor guard flying at his heels, as the legendary warrior charged the barbed prism fiends. His axe and blazing pistol reaping a heavy toll amongst the evil alien. Energy beams tore at their armor, and bladed limbs hacked at them furiously, but they could not be beaten by the Xenos filth. After losing almost a hundred marines, Dante, with a defiant scream, charged for the center of the lead vessel. At its center, a vast machine, part crystal, part something else, sat, linked to all things within the crystal vessel. He battled the fiend for almost three days, fighting through wave after wave of burning energy, which scorched his armor as black as soot, melting his Primarch's death mask painfully onto his face in the process. At last, with the final howl of wrath, he hacked the thing's glacial mind in twain. With that, a mighty roar resounded throughout the vessel, and it did fall from the heavens, shattering and crumbling as it did so. Cassus I, already mortally wounded by the chaotic battle above, was finally slain by the fallen mountains of glass, many kilometers long. Blast waves, miles wide, fanned out from the deadly impacts, destroying billions of lives in an instant. Yet, disgustingly, the crystal aliens survived. Dante, furious at the monsters, ordered cyclonic barrages and torpedo volleys to pulverize the surface and slay the beasts, regardless of casualties. The entire civilization of the Vastina was snuffed out a year later, after months of bitter and futile hit and run naval engagements across the asteroid fields of the system. 70 Blood Angel vessels were destroyed, almost 100 damaged. It was a hateful, miserable campaign, which left the Blood Angels drained, and the humans of the system all but exterminated. Yet, the Angels could not rest. Over the next hundred years of conflict, the Angels traveled up and down the sector surrounding Baal Secundus, battling Xenos threat after Xenos threat, putting down swarms of ravening demon spawn, destroying sicker covens which had driven worlds insane, as well as heretical armies of deluded men. They fought on, but with every battle the Angels realized they were more and more alone. No Imperial forces came to aid them, 
No thanks came from sector capitals. Nothing. And, with every war and every barely won victory, the death toll amongst their human charges increased and increased. As the years wore on, many more of the blood angels found themselves in the death company, and those not succumbing to their urges hardened their hearts further and further. Eventually, 700 Astartes returned to Bale Secundus, battered and bloody, dragging almost 100 frothing mad death company with them. When they entered the system, they knew something was very wrong. The orbital defense batteries were blazing with weapons discharge and launching torpedoes. The other planets of the system rumbled with tense conflict, and, most sickening of all, Imperial naval craft were at the forefront. These were no heretics, but their hulls were painted in the triple helix pattern of the Trivet Imperium, one of the many petty realms of post-Imperial mankind. They were invading Bale, warring with the defiant chapter serfs, who fought alongside furious tribesmen of the blood tribes of Secundus against the invaders. The traitorous post-imperials themselves had allies, in the mutant warbands which roamed Bale Secundus like a cancer, and the bitter war had obviously been raging for many years. Dante, his heart utterly broken, finally succumbed to the rage. The Black Rage. Like righteous demons, the Blood Angels fell upon their enemy, the Trivet. Bolters barked, chains wards tore, blood was drunk, and bones were pulverized. And, through all the slaughter and death, Dante, his scorched armor dull and gore soaked, wept beneath his mask. Horus. Horus he cried, his mind replaying the events of a long lost past, as he slew all around him with his glowing axe. The petty imperial forces were driven from the system, their numbers greatly culled by the experienced naval commanders of the Blood Angels. Those vessels too slow to flee were boarded and captured. Serfs swarmed the vessels and brought them back to the fortress monastery, to be consecrated as worthy of a start's use. Dante was dragged from the field by his retainers on the orders of Mephiston, the highest ranking survivor of the preceding centuries of war. Thus, the master of death became master of the blood as well. Mephiston was a strange and sinister being. An aura of utter dread surrounded the chief librarian now chapter master. He had lived beyond the black rage. His own were quenching the terrible psychic curse within. He had reached into his own mind, and plucked out the defect. No mortal should be able to do so, and yet he did. Some say when he did so, and returned to reality, he was not the same being that had left. As leader, he looked upon his homeworld with condescending malice. It was primitive. Despite all the blood angels purity and culture, they would always come from beasts. Let us remake our cattle anew, lest their brutishness taint our perfection. He was quoted as remarking once, in reference to the tribal humans, cowering in the toxic hellscape of Bale Secundus. Upon the blighted soil, he had great bastions crafted, by the toil of millions. Each bastion was a complete walled city. Marble and grand carvings dominated every archway, every door. These became shelters for the tribesmen against the various horrors of Bale, who eventually, through Mephiston's propaganda and persuasion, became residents of these baroque and magnificent edifices. At the center of these great cities, towers rose uneasily. Their chambers were forbidden, and the processes therein were secret, for Mephiston and his sanguinary priests had discovered a means to cure the Black Rage. He had found that, once injected with a viral strain of genocide, before being completely drained of blood, a human could provide the means to cure the black rage. However, this draining of blood became a method to unleash controlled bursts of the red thirst. The great and ravening hunger and rage of their long dead gene father allowed them to boil away the psychic backlash of their primarch. In resisting the black rage, they succumbed to the red thirst. Yet, for the unfortunate marines still suffering the empathetic rage of Sanguinius, there was little hope. Mephiston had these monsters cast out, tossing them out beyond the cities, into the nuclear hell beyond. These deranged death company marines and errant flesh tearers, descended further, becoming abominations. Out in the wastes they encountered the original mutant tribes, twisted monstrous beasts, failed blood angel clones, and other terrors, and fought and ripped and tore. Their battered armor became tatters around their bulking, rage-fueled limbs. They killed anything and everything, with the truly insane Dante at their head. Deep within the cities, the Blood Angels implemented their plans. Taking only dissidents and criminals at first, their vampiric rule was relatively benevolent. The townsmen feared the dread, thrusting giants, yet they knew obedience would keep them alive. Mephiston had chroniclers write of their epic wars, in poetry and song and art. Classical learning and complex theology were openly discussed, by the dull days of Baal, high culture, based upon internal factors, reigned supreme, by night. 
terror and blood rained all the more fiercely, as the blood angels began to become desperate. Criminals were in short supply, and constant replenishment was required to prevent the black rage consuming their bodies. They began to hunt the people, careful to leave enough alive to sustain a population. No one could flee, because the Astartes controlled the spacecraft, and outside the imposing walls mutants and black rage filled nightmares stalked the lands. Gradually, over centuries upon centuries, the blood angels changed. Gone were the white knights of purity and legend, now they were infamous and dreadful. Many of the Astartes loathed this existence, and petitioned for exile into the wider galaxy, to find the Imperium as they put it which most suspected meant find a true cure for their affliction. In actuality, however, most of the blood angels began to revel in the awe and gut-wrenching fear they created in their cattle. Many converted their armor, giving it the fearsome appearance of ancient plate armor of ages past, as if ancient polytheistic gods of pagan primitivity had arisen amongst man, and had come to feast. Many sculpted or adorned their helms with skull imagery, or otherwise created the impression they were agents of bloody death. Some fitted strange vox units to their helms, which made disturbing electronic howls during their hunts, thus amplifying their horror. They forgot the traditions of their chapter, becoming obsessed with their own fabricated high cultures. Sanguinius and the Emperor were still praised, yet the now titled Blood Knights of Baal became almost like saints, on par with their gene fathers. To maintain strong recruits, children gladiatorial pits were crafted in the townships, and the young of the cities were forced to battle for supremacy. Few made the cut, but occasionally a warrior child with enough naked aggression and skill passed the test. Of these, few survived the implanting process. Those that did became blood knights themselves, and began to learn the history of their realm, and their place within it. It was often said the youngest knights were the worst. They felt the red thirst keenly, and greedily ripped open throats and veins, injecting gene seed into their prey through complex Nartharkarian devices, before draining their victims dry, thus staving off the black rage for another month or so. By 342 M43 there had to be a chain, Mephiston, the ever-living psychic lord and master of Baal, decided it was time for the knights to truly rise again. They would find new blood, and new foes. They would see what if anything survived the combined horrors of both the new devourer, the doom of the Imperator, and the loss of the guiding light. While before, as the Imperium shattered around them, the blood angels fought to maintain their realm. Now, the blood knights fought to reclaim, and remake their realm, for they thrusted, as never before. New blood and new life became the dread war cry of these descended savages, as their captured fleets began to make their first, tentative steps. Out into the ruined monstrosity that was the galaxy of the second age of strife period, they desired but one thing to wash the petty imperiums, the heretics, the monsters, the rebels, all away, in a vile tide of blood-soaked carnage. If they were to suffer the thirst, so would the galaxy suffer. Section 23 The Cognate 200 M43 to 992 M48 The triumphant death howl of the Emperor upon his destruction was as a grand gale of psychic force. As with the first age of strife, sickers sprang up with ever increasing frequency. It was said not a single world in the galaxy didn't have a sicker living upon its surface. Many were cruelly murdered by the ignorant barbarians of their now fully isolated primal and, in some extreme case studies, more developed industrial and hive world. Often the reverse was true. Sickers rose up to drown their worlds in madness and blood. The black ships visited worlds less and less frequently, eventually, by M46, ceasing their rounds entirely. Thus, the sicker epidemic was further exacerbated. Demons and other warp devils took advantage. Hundreds of worlds, both within petty imperiums and beyond, were utterly consumed by ravening warp energies, capering demons, and all manner of heinous things. Vampires openly rose up on a dozen planets, draining thousands upon thousands of people dry, their eternal thirst for psychic sustenance unbearable. Mindwalkers and seconkening wasps spread from world to world, as crotalids migrated in ever greater number. On one world, the warp was so disturbed, it was claimed that an element of the next general author begins vomiting, babbling in language untranslatable by cogitator. Servitors on standby, subject recovers, and the entire sector was utterly removed from existence. Luckily, the vile essence of the deep warp did not crop up again, throughout the entire period, we can only pray it never does. Anyway, even as the petty Imperium squabbled and made war against one another, and as Xenos, rogues and chaotic armies rampage across the Milky Way, this subtle increase of sickers caused untold damage, beyond the realization of these ignorant little empires and power magnates. 
Yet, with every rule, there is an exception. Upon the world of San Vaga there had always been a tradition of psychic discipline. When the warp was thrown into turmoil this discipline was kept intact. Though their astropaths and navigators died or went mad, the disciplined sicker priests of the world did not go berserk, and in fact managed to bring the newly created sickers under their control, and saved the planet from destruction. This, unfortunately, was not to last. Across the planet, a virulent disease began to spread. Some claimed it was a demon virus, spread by a traveling troop of nerdlich cultists, disguised as pleasure girls, who were prevalent across the world. Traveling across national and cultural boundaries seemingly at will, whatever the cause, the virus began to kill everything on the planet, spreading from the crotch outwards, rotting the victims internally as they screamed, aghast at their fates. Only the sicker monks managed to stave off corruption, their minds drove away the demon virus, pulverizing the microscopic demons, which surged invisibly across the entire planet. Some were consumed physically, however, such was their psychic might, that their minds, impossibly, remained, disembodied and screaming silently. However, most managed to seal themselves within their towers, fashioning wards of unimaginable power. The demon virus, frustrated at being denied, possessed the countless dead of the planet, fashioning itself a host of billion. The army of corpses assailed their magical towers for decades, until the warp energy accumulated by the virus dissipated, and the demon was banished, leaving a world of corpses. The priests vowed that this would never happen again, they saw that the plague was assigned sickers were the future of humanity, and only they were worthy. Across the warp they pulled their powers, and sent out a message, to any witches or psychics in rain, the cognate is come, gather at San Vaga, bring only your mind and your magics. The future starts now. Over the next few decades sickers of varying powers and specialities began to arrive. Some had stolen tiny transport craft, using their own powers to guide them through the sea of souls. Others chartered ships who became becalmed or lost in the warp, leaving the sickers to escape in pots. Some had banded together and traded for a vessel, and collectively piloted it to the planet. Thousands of sickers came, then came the trials. The first was the planet itself. Swaling with despairing souls, the sickers had to travel through the mountains of rotting dead, to reach the towers. Many went insane, many did not. The second was the corruption trial. The priests tested each sicker who came, screeing through their minds with their powerful abilities. Those who were corrupt, were destroyed. When the trials were complete, the cognate began to take shape. A series of tears made up the ranks of the psychic organization. The first tear were the oldest and or most powerful members of the cognate. Those of the original priests, the alpha level sickers and above, and some of the most powerful sicker wraiths. The second tear ranged from the beta sickers down to the delta levels. Beneath them were all the rest, the third tear. The first tier decided upon topics of research, and judged the others. The second tear researched the topics, and gathered power and sorcerous magics. The third tear did the grunt work serving the upper tiers, maintaining the towers and forming the sacrum, an army of warrior sickers to defend the cognate. Using a combination of captured PDF weapons and their own warp spawned power, the centuries wore on, and the cognate turned all its sorcery, knowledge and unthinkable power into learning and developing their understanding of the warp and their power. Devices were fashioned and artifacts crafted in the deep vaults of the cognate's towers. As a soul is a firefly, flickering in the warp, the world of the cognate was a vast unreal sun, blazing with soul fire and leeching ever more energy from the warp. Demons and angels flocked around the world like a warp spawned miasma. Only the titanic wards crafted by the founders kept the madness at bay, locked behind a colossal conceptual wall of hexes and room. Words and whispers traveled, across the churning sea of chaos, through the realm of the soul. Rumors became little beasts which scampered through the madness, bringing their diabolical message to any who had the power to comprehend it. Languishing in his realm of crystal and glass, the message beings gathered around the great red sorcerer's warp-bound listening horn. Magnus, the vast lord of the thousand suns, became aware of this clan of sickers. He looked upon their world through his singular warp sight, and he grew envious. He must possess their knowledge. In 992 M46, after centuries of fraud travel through the even more insane and hazardous warp, visitors arrived upon San Vaga. The cognate became aware of them when a vessel inscribed with curious, forbidden rooms entered orbit above their world. Within that same week, a party of nine landed upon the sicker world. These nine passed across the surface of the world, without being driven insane by the howling wraiths. When they reached the gates of the 66 towers of the cognate, 
They, unbelievably, bypassed the powerfully warded barriers, their sorcery allowing them to step through a shimmering portal, directly into the central hall of the Cognate, to the astonished gasps of the sicker lords themselves. Before them stood nine towering giants, bedecked in glimmering gold and blue plate. Eight of the party stood perfectly still, their hollow helms staring impassively, as they held their bolters perfectly still. The ninth was obviously a sorcerer, his armor even more ostentatious than his comrades, his staff held loosely in his heavy gauntlets. This was Lord Severinus, the latest in the line of chief librarians of Magnus personal cabal of heathen warp channelers and sickers. Arrogantly, he addressed the cognate's leaders directly, ignoring protocol entirely. My dear witch doctors and soothsayers, he was said to have uttered. My lord, Magnus the Omniscient, the Red Cyclops of the All Knowledge, has looked upon your great works, and is impressed. Should you wish it, he would gladly allow your highest thinkers into his own great cabal. All that he asks for in return, is knowledge. Is this not a grand and merciful gift? The second tier were outraged, and the sickers had to concentrate in order to repress such murderous thoughts. The grim, wooded figures of the Council of 66, the greatest of all the cognate, were quiet. Of course, none of the cognate truly spoke verbally anymore, but even their minds were silent, as they considered the disgusting proposal of Severinus. Eventually they responded, as a single voice, or dread power, we recognize your master not. His god is not our god, and his authority does not hold sway here. Be gone, insect. At this, it was said Severinus erupted into a fit of hysterical laughter. Not his realm. The lord of all change has dominion over all things. Think not that even you, walled up in your towers, are unassailable. Reconsider, or you shall surely perish. By the very well of eternity, your cognate shall fall, without my master the slimy villain proclaimed. Again, the cognate dismissed him, in a fit of rage, his patience exhausted, Severinus lashed out with his venomous mind, striking at the leader of the cognate himself. Suddenly, the central hall was in uproar and madness, as the thousand suns turned their bolters upon the surrounding witches and sickers, who in turn lashed out with their own power. Severinus was a tornado of power, arcs of blue and pinkish fire erupting from him in devastating arcs, as lightning and blazing darkness poured from his talon-tipped gauntlets. Bodies were blown apart by gunfire, astarts were blasted to pieces or forcibly banished from the hall, and warp power flowed like oil throughout the room. Yet, while Severinus was as a tornado, the lords of the cognate were as hurricanes. Megavo, a master pyrokine, speared warp fire across the evil sorcerer, burning him to his very soul. Lord Severinus hissed in utter agony, only just managing to teleport from the hall and back to his waiting ship in orbit. Back upon his vessel his own cabal of sorcerers, both human and thousand sun, began to weave their own devastating magics in response. While they prepared, the Astart Strike Cruiser unleashed a barrage of scorching bombardment shells upon the 66 towers of the Cognate. Yet, even as the munitions neared, invisible forces plucked them from reality, or crushed them in midair, detonating them harmlessly miles above the towers. The powers of the Cognate were mighty indeed, then the Thousand Suns unleashed their sorcerous return fire. Like two ships dueling in the void, the two cabals battled across the psychic plane, unleashing hellish powers and terrible energies upon each other. Mewling spawn monsters were created which battered the towers, only to be destroyed by dozens of vortex portals. Wraiths were weaponries, some were banished. Over six years, the two psychic forces fought each other to near exhaustion. Yet, the cognate landed the final, decisive blow. A great warp-borne wind swept impossibly across the void, buffeting the entire starship away from their world, forcing it to enter the warp against its will. Severinus, howling curses, was denied. Little more than a charred skeleton supported by scorched, enchanted power armor, Severinus looked like the face of death, as he fled back to his master in disgrace. It seemed as if the cognate had defeated Severinus' prophecy, and had survived. However, the war had taken its toll. The cognate found that its numbers dwindled over the following 2000 years. Null ships would sneak into their territories, and greedy bounty hunters and mercenaries would steal sicker children from their beds, to be sold into slavery for the men of petty imperiums. Who paid handsomely for cognate trained sickers? Demons constantly assailed them from the abyss, desperate to devour the succulent souls within their hard shell. Likewise, Chaos Warbands, eager to test their metal, would constantly send warriors to assail the world, stretching the power of the Sacran way for thin, as they fought off threat after threat. As with all empires in the second age of strife, they were gradually eroded, 
like a tidal roads a beach. No matter their power, they were not all powerful. Desperate for new recruits and new blood, the cognates send out ambassadors across the warp, blindly hoping these ambassadors would bring new recruits, or hire themselves out to local imperiums. However, few ever return. Most were simply killed in the warp, as without the Astronomicon long distance travel was essentially suicide. Those that survived often found they did not wish to make the return journey, and instead offered their services to any who could offer them security, or pay. Often they were simply enslaved or tortured. A scant few were employed by powerful lords of entire petty imperiums, or became captains of great vessels. Meanwhile, the cognate became weary and distressed. The second tier became disillusioned with the top tier, and many civil wars erupted intermittently, costing yet more lives they simply couldn't spare. Eventually, in 992 M48, when a group of the League of the Purge entered the system, the Sickers most of whom were now just second tier or lower were unable to prevent the Purge from callously launching multiple virus bomb assaults upon the world, utterly killing everyone on the world, such is the price of hope in the post-imperial galaxy. If you haven't already check out my Redbubble portfolio, you might just find something you like. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services. It's time to stop!